the more you make your visitors think, the more you make your visitors search and wonder, you're going to cause friction. And that friction results in visitors exiting the site and giving up on your specific brand and many times never coming back. Welcome to the Agents of Change, the podcast experience you've been waiting for your entire marketing career. Search, social, mobile, AI, blockchain, and neuromarketing. These are the Agents of Change, and so are you. Digital marketing success awaits, and your transformation begins now. Welcome to another episode of the Agents of Change podcast. The podcast is all about helping you reach and engage more of your ideal customers online so that you can grow your career and grow your business. My name is Rich Brooks. I'm your host. This is episode 543, powered by the 10th annual Agents of Change Digital Marketing Conference. I sometimes wonder if it's time to expand the roster of the Agents of Change. Right now we have six. The original three from 2012, Search, Social, and Mobile Marketing. And then we have the three that we added back in 2022, 23, coming out of COVID. Neuro, short for neuromarketing, AI, and blockchain. Two that I have already kicked myself for not including are content, which would just be a nice catch-all for when I don't have the perfect agent for a given guest. And measurement, which is such an underappreciated part of digital marketing. Measurement is like your guy or gal in the chair, if, if you get that comic book reference. But today I'm realizing that I may have missed another opportunity for an agent for conversion rate optimization, as this is a recurring theme on this podcast. After all, what's the point of a huge social following, or ranking number one on Google, or even blowing up your email list if you can't convert people once they get to your website? Still, nine agents is probably too much. Maybe I need like a junior team, like the New Mutants, or Young Avengers, or or the Teen Titans if you're a DC fan. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, don't worry, I'll get off the whole comic book thing right now. Today, we're gonna be looking at conversion rate optimization or CRO and how you can improve the conversion rate at your own website with a simple framework. Quick reminder that our sponsor, the 10th annual Agents of Change Digital Marketing Conference is coming this fall, 2024, to Portland, Maine, and will be streaming online. CRO is just one of the topics we'll be covering in this in-person event with digital marketing experts from around the U.S. and Canada. Join us in person to grow your career and your business as we tackle topics like Facebook ads, AI, social media marketing, vertical videos, the customer journey, and more. At the time of this recording, you can still save $100 off your ticket price, whether you grab a regular conference ticket our VIP upgrade, or a digital pass. That's right. You can watch the live stream of the event and also get all the content on demand with the digital pass. The conference is in Portland, Maine on October 9th, 2024, with our deep dive workshops on October 10th. These are half-day, hands-on, small workshop-style learning opportunities where you will be working on your projects with one of our speakers in the room leading you really amazing way of upskilling quickly. This is an event you're not going to want to miss. Whether you're the director of marketing, an owner, entrepreneur, social media manager, or just responsible for generating more business online. To see the full agenda, meet our speakers, and reserve your spot, head on to theagentsofchange.com now and avoid future FOMO. The link is also going to be in the show notes as well. Now, let's discover the SHIP method to more conversions and more sales online. My next guest is a recognized expert on experimentation and marketing optimization. Oh, I love that. She is an in-demand speaker who has presented at marketing conferences throughout the world. With over 16 years of entrepreneurial and marketing experience, she helps companies create websites that visitors fall in love with while increasing their online sales. Her clients include eBay, 3M, the Special Olympics, Dish Network, Discovery, and many, many more. She is the co-author of Conversion Optimization, an Amazon.com best-selling book. 
In that book, she combines groundbreaking market research with powerful storytelling and case studies to demonstrate how to leverage these principles to create killer websites. She provides one of the most comprehensive lists of strategies and actionable insights for helping websites capture more of their visitors into lifetime customers. She provides insights grounded in comprehensive research, the best contemporary psychology and behavioral science, which any company can start implementing immediately. Today, we're going to be diving into improving conversions and sales at your website with Ayat Shikari. Ayat, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. All right. So let's jump right into the fray. I understand that you have a framework, the SHIP methodology, S-H-I-P, that you can help us understand user behavior, and we can use that to increase conversion rates at our websites. Can you walk us through that process? Yep, absolutely. So, I mean, first off, I'd like to say that conversion rate optimization is an important tool that every single company should have in their toolbox. Because essentially, if you're not doing it, you're not learning more about your customers, you're not adapting to the changes within the economy, the changes within, uh, you know, your customer base, there's so many things that impact and influence, and we always need to be on top of it and know and adapt our site accordingly. So we developed this methodology as a result of that. And this methodology, basically, it's easy to remember, SHIP, the word SHIP, S-H-I-P, but it stands for, the S is scrutinize, hypothesize, implement, and propagate. And the S is really important. That's where we spend most of our time in the scrutinized phase. And that's where we're really like delving in deep, really trying to uncover and understand customer behavior based on analytics. So we're diving into their analytics, understanding, you know, where are they going throughout the site? What are those landing pages? How are they performing? And what can we do to really improve that? And then of course, combining that with user uh, research, interviewing customers, conducting polls and surveys so we can understand a little bit more, get some insight into what's going on, what's making them tick, what's stopping them, what are some of the pain points that they're dealing with, and really trying to address that on the site. I'm really understanding, again, that those emotional and social aspects that motivate visitors that are really going to take your website to the next level. And then, of course, you know, there's heat maps, session recordings. There's so many tools that we can be utilizing to understand a little bit more about the whole picture of what, how and why our visitors are behaving the way that they're behavior, behaving on the site. And then, of course, once I understand that, I extract specific problem areas that I've identified and then create hypotheses based on that, create experiments based on those hypotheses, implement them and then learn more. So really my testing is a tool within CRO in order for me to understand a little bit more about the visitor. I've I've made a specific change. I've come up with a specific hypothesis and solution. What type of an impact did it have? Why did the visitor behave that way? We always say a really good experiment is an experiment that starts with good questions, but an even better experiment is one that ends with even better questions. Like I have more questions as a result of this experiment and the results of this experiment before I even started, even if the experiment didn't succeed. Actually, it's those experiments that don't exceed, uh, succeed that help me kind of take a step back and say, what did I do wrong? Why did this experiment not impact the visitor the way that we suspected that it would? It sounds like you're brought in a lot of times when maybe sites aren't as optimized as they could be. But do you have do you have any advice for us? Like if we're just getting started, if there's not a lot of data there, is there anything that we can do to put ourselves in the best possible position to succeed? Yeah, I know. Absolutely. I think there are specific best practices that any type of company can take. So if I'm just building a site, I haven't started yet. I do want to as much as possible, collect some user data. I want to look at my analytics eventually. But if I don't even have that to begin with, the structure that I have my site, I should ensure that, first off, whatever pages my visitor are landing on, there is a primary goal that's very clear. I'm not really bombarding them with multiple goals that might confuse them. I also want to ensure that whatever pages that they're landing on, I understand what ads are running so that there's continuity between the language, the copy, the image that's on the ad, and the actual end result of of the landing page. If there's a lack of continuity there, you're going to lose a lot of customers. So these are just best practices that anybody can kind of, when they're launching their new site, when they're launching their new business, they could think about some of 
of these. I also want to make sure that, you know, whatever action I want the visitor to take, that's above the fold. It's clear. It's easy for them to, to, to find. The more you make your visitors think, the more you make your visitors search and wonder, you're going to cause friction. And that friction results in visitors exiting the site and giving up on your specific brand and many times never coming back. All right. So for those of us who do have some data to look at, you know, you mentioned you do some deep dive and you analyze and you mentioned heat map tools. What are some of the different tools that you use when you're trying to get a better understanding of user behavior on the website? So one of the key things that I always, and I I think you hear this with a lot of marketing talk is always, you know, talk to your customers, right? Like you want to conduct customer interviews. We conduct a specific type of interviews. It's called jobs to be done. And this is all about really trying to understand the progress that a visitor is trying to make by purchasing your specific service or tool. So this helps us uncover really the emotional and social aspects because A lot of times when I'm just asking questions, generic questions, or if I'm running some sort of like a poll or a survey, I might get really top of mind answers from my customers. And that's really not what I want. I don't want like, you know, top of mind. I want to dig deep. I really want to understand the reasons and the emotional and social reasons. People are like, no, this is an impulse purchase. I don't believe in impulse purchases. There's always something there. And every single time somebody's told me it's an impulse purchase and I just do a little bit of digging into some of those so- social and emotional to kind of get to that 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 meat, I'm able to find out that actually, no, it wasn't an impulse. There were some reasons and some aspects that led them to selecting this particular product or service. So I think customer interviews, and if you follow a specific methodology to your customer interviews, can be very valuable. We even utilize the cop, like the... Um, from the interview, some of the words of the customers within the copy on the site, and we're able to see some amazing impact on the rest of the customers. Because again, it's from customers' words. So a lot of people may be feeling, again, the same way that these customers are feeling. So that's one area that from a user research perspective that is very, very important and very easy if you do have data and you have a customer base. They're they're already people that are dedicated to your brand. So trying to get them onto an interview and maybe offering them a little bit of an incentive, maybe like, a a gift card or something like that shouldn't be too difficult, but the insights that you can find are very, very valuable. I love to utilize, of course, heat map session recording. Session recordings, they're great to kind of just give me a sense of how visitors are flowing, especially if I recognize, for example, within analytics, there's an area where visitors are struggling. Then I can pull up some session recordings specifically for that particular page, and I can uncover why are they struggling here? Why do I see a drop off within the funnel in this area on this particular page? I can just pull that from session recording. So it's very, very helpful. And of course, you know, heat maps usually goes along with that. So I find those are are some really great ways. One other thing that I would probably add to customer interviews is sometimes we'll conduct maybe only six or seven interviews, but then we'll validate some of the answers that we get from the customers through a survey. And we see if the rest of the customer base have some of the same inclinations that these that particular set of six customers had. So we can validate further and ensure that this is something that we're seeing. It's like a broader problem or a broader broader issue or a broader pain point that customers are facing. I love that. And I can see how, you know, we've at our own company, we have our clients, you know, our deal clients that have bought from us and we could definitely reach out to them. But obviously we could also learn from people who didn't buy from us. Is there any methodology that you have, or maybe it's not a method, maybe it's approach, maybe it's a tool to be able to survey people who chose not to move forward with you? Or is that just a black box we can't open? No, we've, so we'll do some uh, polling. So for example, if we find that there is a high exit rate on a specific page, we may run an exit intent pool. So as soon as the visitor hovers over the X to close a page, the pop-up comes up and then we capture kind of some information to understand a little bit more of like, well, what are you struggling with? Why don't don't you want to move forward? And this is, you know, this especially useful down the funnel, because if I have somebody like, you know, towards the end of the funnel and they're abandoning, I want to really capture and understand you've made it this far. You've put in so much effort. What's stopping you from moving forward from here? Mm. Now, of course, on mobile, that's not Mm. possible. And I know that a lot of traffic is uh, more mobile focused. So what we do is we'll look at the amount of time that people typically 
the average time that people typically spend on that particular page. When they exceed that time or if that around that time, that's when that pop-up may appear to kind of capture a little bit more information and understand why are they not moving forward? Why are they hesitating? Why are they spending more time on that page? So those are just some ways that you can capture a little bit more information. But of course, you know, analytics sometimes can give you a little bit of a story. It can tell you where the drop-offs are happening. You can start looking at the site and do some evaluations yourself. We do something, our team-wide kind of heuristic evaluation of a site, which helps us uncover a lot of UX issues that might be stopping people from moving forward that maybe you wouldn't have realized or you wouldn't have recognized if you don't look at your analytics to understand where visitors are dropping off and why they're struggling with certain things. So those are kind of just some tools that help to capture and understand a little bit more. I'm wondering if you have any brand affinities when it comes to these tools. Like I know with heat maps, there's there's Crazy Egg and there's Hotjar and now there's Clarity from Microsoft. If you're comfortable with it, what are some of your go-to tools in your tool set when you're looking at these analytics? Well, I mean, I have a bias because uh, actually <laughs> we have we have our own conversion rate optimization tool, okay. which is um, FigPi, F-I-G-P-I-I. And that's, uh, it has heat maps, session recording, polling, as well as A-B testing. So a lot of those tools oh, cool. sometimes have only one of one aspect, but this tool actually has it all. So it's really helpful. And then I can pull up, pull the heat maps and session recording specifically for an experiment that I'm running, which is amazing because then I can figure out what's happening happening within that particular experiment that that I have actually launched. So, but I'm pretty agnostic as well in the sense that I'll use whatever tool my clients have, but if you were going to ask me, I would obviously tell you that FigPi is the best. Awesome. <laughs> and for those playing at home, I had no idea that you actually had your own tool. That was not <laughs> me just as a plan trying to uh, prompt you, but very cool to know. So you had mentioned, you kind of teased before that there are, you need to go beyond just it was an impulse buy. I'm sure with your experience, you've probably seen some universal emotional and social reasons behind customer purchases. Can you share what some of the biggest reasons are why people buy or don't buy? And then how might we leverage some of that information in our own marketing strategies? So the reason why, you know, again, the emotional and social reasons why people don't buy, a lot of times, again, we're not providing visitors with enough information. So they're having to go investigate a little bit more or look at other brands that might offer something similar. So what I've always found is sometimes putting more information up front is better, but there's also like, it's a fine line. Cause like we always also say less is more, right? Like if I provide too much and I overwhelm visitors, then I might be actually stopping them from moving forward. So there's a balance between making sure I'm providing them with really like the essential information that's going to prompt them and get them to actually move forward. I don't want my purchase ever to be focused on price, right? Like I want it to be about all the other reasons, all the other benefits. But when you create a strategy around your products or services that are is very, very focused on price, then you're really missing out on relaying to them the, the benefits and really triggering that emotional and social reasons behind them wanting to actually make this particular purchase. So that's why what one of the strategies we've deployed is really being trying to focus, especially on the smaller brands, is focus more on the brand and what the brand is bringing to the table. So we have one client, for example, that they sell these beautiful pajamas. And these pajamas, actually, they have like a, a specific, you know, like they're creating the the prints and they're going through this this whole process of of creating these prints between like, you know, having the artist draw out the print and then, you know, getting a special factory that creates these prints. I mean, it's a whole beautiful process, but nothing in the site was relaying this information to the end user. Mm -hmm. For the end user, they're getting to this, the page and they're just like, these are some expensive, <laughs> you know, pajamas. I'm not going to actually move forward and purchase them. So what we did was, and actually the interesting thing was that majority of the visitors that were coming through their paid ads were performing a lot worse than any other visitor. So we said, listen, mm -hmm. before the visitor actually gets to the product page with all, with all the details and information about the product, let us sell them on the brand because these are very top of funnel customers that are coming. I mean, they're seeing something very, very beautiful and they're convinced with that image, they're clicking on it. But then as soon as they see the product page and they see the price, they're just like, oh, this is not yeah. for me. 
right? So we needed to highlight the brand as much as possible, really communicate to them what this product was all about and all the beautiful, you know, the process through making these beautiful prints and and how they're so unique to this brand. And really, you know, this was more of a treat. And again, going back to those customer interviews, whenever we interviewed any of their customers, they, were, they would always tell us that they felt like they were really treating themselves when they bought these pajamas and when they mm-hmm. wore the pajamas and made them feel like a million bucks. And that was what we wanted to communicate to the end user that this is this is what the, the, these pajamas are going to make you feel. And uh, we were able to see an amazing increase in conversion rates, I think like 30% increase in conversion rates on their paid campaigns. So, you know, again, it's it's about really like highlighting some of that information and knowing exactly what to highlight. Now, again, we might go back and be like, okay, so somebody listening to this podcast might say, okay, then we need to throw all this information in and on the product page. And overall, we didn't do that. We actually made sure we tested it. So I would definitely tell you, test it and make sure you're testing one aspect at a time. Don't throw a million things at the page and then be like, oh, what one, what impacted them positively? What impacted them negatively? We have no idea how to tell because we did a million changes. So you want to make sure that you're a little bit more careful about the type of changes that you're making, how you're making them, and you're thoughtful about how I'm going to measure this. Because otherwise, you're not going to really understand what type of an impact it had. When you're suggesting these changes, working with your clients to make them, can you give us a sense of how long it takes to know and how much data you require to know that these made a scientifically recognizable difference. And okay, we know this worked or we know this didn't work and let's go on to the next thing. Like, what does that process look like for you? Yeah, absolutely. So whenever we work with any type of a client, we're always looking at all of their pages and taking sample sizes. So like, for example, I wanna run an experiment on the product page. I'm gonna understand what is the sample size that I need to get to in order for me to get a statistically valid result, a statistically significant result? And so so that's a measurement that happens prior to me even conducting the experiment. Because if I see that the sample size is going to take me three months for me to be able to get a result, I'm probably going to do away with the (laughs) testing on that particular page. It probably doesn't make sense, right? There's not enough data for me to be able to come up with a really good result because within three months, so much can change. So your results are not going to be as valid. So you want to make sure that your experiments are running no more than a month, really. That's even like very, very like extreme. Ideally, two to three weeks, I'm running an experiment and I'm able to actually find out what those results are. So my sample size should not exceed that period of time. But that's what those sample size calculators tell us. They tell us how long this experiment is going to run and whether or not it makes sense for me to actually move forward and, and run something. Now, not all sites have a lot of conversions. And that's it doesn't mean that they shouldn't be doing testing. But how we would approach a site that doesn't have a lot of conversions is we would look at micro goals. So rather than me looking at a completed conversion, I'm going to look at visitors that may, for example, make it to the checkout or make make it to the form or make it to this next page. And that way, at least I can measure, are they progressing in the right way that I want them to progress or are they not? And so that works for smaller sites, for sites that have smaller sets of data. So I can be able to kind of run experiments and find out more information or information and, and get statistically valid results in a, in a shorter period of time. I, I want to make sure I understand it. So it sounds like if I don't have a lot of data, if I don't have a lot of visitors, statistically speaking, that I may need to start my experimentations closer to the top of the funnel. But if I'm data rich and I'm getting tons of visitors and tons of conversions, then maybe the most valid place to start my experimentation is towards the end to improve those final conversion steps from like checkout to actually purchase? Yes. So if I have a lot of visitors and a lot of conversions, then I can certainly measure the entirety of the purchase process, right? So so let me kind of take a step back. Whenever I'm running an experiment, I might have multiple goals. Okay. One of the goals might be the final conversion goal. So like a purchase, for instance, but I might also be measuring other things. Like if I'm running an experiment on the homepage, I don't only want my experiment to measure 
the final conversion from a homepage. I want to look at other things. I want to look at, okay, well, did I get other, like, depending on what the experiment is, do I, did I get more visitors to make it to the product pages? Did I get more visitors to click on this particular element? It might be like an element that I'm testing on the actual homepage. So mm-hmm. there are multiple goals that I, I want to be running. So for example, I can't measure a full conversion, but I might be able to measure within the homepage, I might be able to measure visitors making it to the product page or visitors making it to the PLP. And that way I can get a valid result of whether or not this experiment was able to move visitors down. But again, that Mm -hmm. full conversion might take way longer than that. So I need to be able to still measure something that's valid for the experiment. And it might be multiple things, you know, or click data. Maybe I want to measure they're clicking on the search more, or whatever it is. But those are going to give me a little bit more better of a read of how this experiment actually performed. And I'm still going to be able to do some experimentation. Like I, what I'm trying to say is that just because you have a smaller set of data shouldn't mean that you can't run experiments, but it just means that you have to be a little bit creative with the type of goals and the type of measuring that you're doing. That makes a lot of sense. What do you see as some of the common mistakes that businesses make when they're trying to optimize a website for conversions on their own? I think one of the key common mistakes is that they're trying to do too many or make too many changes at once. So rather than testing a couple of variables, they're testing maybe like 10 different variables. So it makes it very difficult for me to determine what impact that change actually had. So that's one mistake. Uh, The other mistake I would say is also just setting up the goals and understanding what I want to measure and how I'm going to measure it. And then the third one is sometimes you, when you first run an experiment, you might immediately look at the results and the immediate results look like they are, you know, like there's like a massive, like, you know, increase in conversion rates or a massive impact. And so people get really excited and they shut it off but they didn't run it long enough. They don't run it through the sample size that you know mm-hmm. you had initially calculated. So, and actually the experiment wasn't going to result in that. You know, it actually decreased conversion rates because <laughs> you have to run it through that sample size to get a really statistical read. So people shut things off, they get too excited and they don't you know, recognize that I really need to run it through the entire sample size before I shut off the experiment. You mentioned sample size a couple of times. I don't know if this is a super nerdy question or just something I should already know, but like, how do you determine when you're looking at a page what the sample size needs to be to get that statistically significant result that we're looking for? So the nice thing is you can Google sample size or calculators that actually just tell you and it asks you to input the number of visitors that make it to that page and the conversion rate on that page. And that way it can then calculate for you what type of a sample size that is and how long an experiment is going to run. So the nice thing is, you know, for majority and even actually whatever testing tool you're using, majority of the tools that are already out there that are doing A-B testing will calculate it for you, which is super convenient. And you don't even have to think about it. And it tells you already, like, this is what the sample size is, is how long this experiment is going to run. So you don't even have to, to worry about any of that. Awesome. Fantastic. I want to check those out. Artificial intelligence is obviously taking over all aspects of marketing, if not all aspects of the world. And I'm just curious to know about how or if you're using it and seeing it in the tools and what impact you think that AI might have in terms of conversion rate optimization moving forward. Yeah, I think, you know, again, like I I believe that AI has a lot of advantages, but I still do think it's in the infancy and it's in the early stages. I think there's still a long ways to go. I'd love to see it to the point where it can start actually suggesting experiments based on data mm. points, but I don't know that, I don't think that we're there yet. So I certainly think that there's a moment in time that we, we need to kind of uh, surpass. But I think right now, the way that we're leveraging the AI is that we're taking kind of that input, you know, for example, when we run a poll, run, we run interviews, we'll input that data and then we'll see, you know, like kind of like what are some of the outputs that AI is able to come up with based on that. Or for example, we may, especially when it comes to copy, there's like so much opportunity with AI to utilize chat GPT to run specific 
whether it's interviews that I've conducted, whether it's research that I've conducted, and then see based on what AI would suggest that we use as headlines, as copy for specific areas of the site, we've found that very, very helpful. So we've kind of been able to leverage AI with that particular, in those particular use cases. Are there other opportunities that we're always exploring? Definitely. But I, I like I said, I think that at this point in time, it's still, there's a little, a lot of data input that needs to happen initially in order for you to get something useful. But we actually have somebody within our company that created kind of like a CRO helper. But would I say that I would rely on that only, you know, that, that output, the outputs of the chat GPT in that case? Not really. I think, you know, you still need to kind of take a look at it. You need the human eye. You need to make sure that it actually is valid. You need to make sure that it makes sense. Even the copy outputs, a lot of times we we can take some ideas and inspiration, but we still have to kind of make sure that it still works for our particular customers. Absolutely. Although I love your idea of using AI to craft some of the headlines or copy on the page based on that. And we've started as an agency interviewing clients, our own, as well as our clients' customers to try and find trends and reasons why, but I hadn't really taken it to that level. So that's that's a brilliant idea. I'm still be stealing that one. And you also mentioned mobile. And I'm just curious, as you approach CRO, do you have a different approach when it comes to the mobile experience versus the traditional desktop experience? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think uh, you have to treat them as two different devices, two different experiences, mm. two different use cases, for sure. Absolutely. So when it looks at when we're looking at data, we're definitely segmenting. When we're doing testing, we're segmenting between mobile and desktop because again, they're mm. two different experiences. And then when we're creating designs, you have to you know we always take a mobile first approach, dependent on the the client, but for the most part most cases are mobile first. So our designs are always more focused on on mobile, but then we'll of course adapt it. And there might be some things that work on mobile that really just don't work on desktop and vice versa. We keep that in mind because that's so important to recognize that it's a different kind of user, a different kind of experience, depending on, again, like what it is that you're selling. We want to ensure that we're addressing that mobile experience because it's very unique and very different. So, yeah, I mean, absolutely, 100%. There's two different things. You have to treat them differently. And I know responsive has always been a really big thing, but um, you have to be really weary of your responsive and what type of implication it can have on the end user just to ensure that, again, you're addressing all the areas that really impact them and and uh, making sure that you're treating them as two different devices. Awesome. This has been fantastic. If people want to learn more about you, learn more about your company and how they might be able to work with you, where can we send them online? So you can visit our site, investcro.com, or you can visit my profile on LinkedIn, Ayat Shakari. Um, I'm on Twitter, at Ayat, and then also on Instagram, Defrant underscore marketing. I'm sure those will all be available to, to listeners on the uh, show notes. Absolutely. We'll put them right in there. I uh, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. There was a lot of great content that I had shared with us. And if you want the full transcript, or if you just want the highlights, or if you want the links that she shared with us, so you can follow her online and maybe connect with her, all of that's available at our website at theagentsofchange.com slash 543. And while you're there, be sure to check out all the information you need to make the right decision for this year's the 10th annual Agents of Change Digital Marketing Conference on October 9th and 10th, 2024. It's going to be an amazing event here in Portland, Maine. Great time of the year. You can write this off as a business expense. Do you need one more reason to come? I don't think so. It'd be great to meet you, and I hope if you are able to come, that you'll come up to me at some point during the day and say hello and let me know that you heard about the conference by checking out this podcast. Make sure that you're subscribed. We have more great content coming your way, and thanks for being an agent of change. Don't miss another thrilling episode of the Agents of Change podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform.